Um, I've spent the last several, probably a little, little over a couple of weeks at this point, um, growing a, a virus that codes for a functional copy of the lactase enzyme because I am very lactose intolerant. Um, this is this is the final product. Um, I had to package it into three pills because that was what I could get the microcrystalline cellulose to fit into. It's kind of damp. Um, I'm a little worried because I am allergic to penicillin and we use penicillin in the media. So I've got some Benadryl. So I'm going to take two of these and then all of these. And the idea is these will open up in my stomach, release the virus, and then the virus will go into my intestinal lining and give me a functional copy of lactase enzyme. And then here goes. Well, bottoms up. When I was 15, I started getting sick all the time. At first it was pretty infrequent, but I remember the day that it started. I didn't know at the time that I'd suddenly become lactose intolerant, so all the food I was eating was hurting me. Laugh it off, but in my case it wasn't just a bit of gas, I was getting violently ill if I ate even a minute amount of lactose, and symptoms would start in less than an hour. And I'm not alone, this happens to up to 65% of the human population. At some point your ability to eat milk just vanishes and you start getting sick. Symptoms severity varies, but extreme cases like mine can really get in your way. Most people don't actually think about how much lactose is in the food we eat. As a society, we actually produce so much milk for use in cheese making that it's literally a waste product. So all the components are separated out and used and resold for a variety of purposes. The sugars, specifically lactose, are refined and used as filler and flavor in an enormous amount of products. Most pharmaceutical manufacturers use it to bulk up drugs used to make pills so that the tiny amount of drug that they need to carry can be pressed into a comparatively large pill. Whey is used as a sweetener, butter is in everything, as is cheese and cream. I basically had to build a whole skill set around making sure food was safe to eat. I retaught myself to cook and learned how to bake so that I didn't have to miss out on too much good food. But all of this is also the reason I went into biology. From the day I decided on the university program I was going to apply for, I've said the same thing. One day I'll fix this. When I was asked if I was going into biology to end world hunger or some other grand gesture, my response has always been, no dude, I just want to eat pizza again and not need to check every label on everything. And I can happily say that that day is finally here. After six years, I finally have access to the tools and know-how to build a permanent treatment that should restore my lactose tolerance and fix this once and for all. Now, I know the idea of a DIY gene therapy can seem intimidating or scary, so let me set the record straight. While some users make the application of DIY gene therapy look sloppy and sketchy, I'm hoping to change that with this video. I'm going to be as transparent and make sure everything is as clear as possible so you know exactly what I'm doing, how the thing works, and why it's not scary. Also, this project is still in the process of being developed. This video is just the first demonstration of the process. I'll be continuing to refine it over the next little while. Also, this is going to be a longish video, so if you'd like to skip to the testing and results, go to the time you see on screen. Before we get into the lab and get working, let's go over how this is going to work. First, we need to understand both lactose and the enzyme that breaks it down. Lactose is a disaccharide, or simple sugar, that has two subunits one glucose and one galactose subunit. Lactase, also known as beta-galactosidase, the enzyme that breaks it down, splits the two subunits apart and then the individual pieces can actually be absorbed by your body and used for energy. If you don't produce the lactase enzyme, the sugar will make it all the way through your small intestine and into your colon. Your colon is full of a lot more bacteria, especially gas-producing bacteria, and so they feed on the influx of extra available food because the lactose wasn't broken down and absorbed. Also, lactose attracts and holds onto water, so a lot less water is absorbed in your colon than it's supposed to be. Add in irritation and you've got all the classic symptoms of lactose intolerance. So what do we do about it? Well, we need to make my small intestine produce the lactase enzyme again, specifically in what's called the brush border. The brush border is a layer of cells covered in tiny hair-like protrusions. These increase the surface area of the small intestine significantly. These protrusions are also packed full of enzymes that interact with the material passing through and helps break them down. We could use the human gene for lactase, but it's actually standard practice to use a lactase enzyme from E. coli called LAC-Z. LAC-Z is used all throughout biology and in combination with a color changing dye, can be used as a marker to indicate if cells are doing what they're supposed to be doing. When I was looking into this, I found a paper that uses a special virus to deliver a working copy of LAC-Z to the intestinal tract of rats. A week after the researchers applied the virus, they challenged two sets of rats that had previously been completely lactose intolerant with a lactose only diet. 
The rats that had been given the virus maintained their weight and their blood glucose levels went up after they ate the lactose, indicating that they had started to produce the lactase enzyme and was able to use it for calories. The virus they used is called an AAV, or adeno-associated virus. This virus is the gold standard for gene therapy because of its reliability and long history of safety. The wild virus can be found in almost everyone and in most tissue samples that have ever been tested, so it's extremely common, but it doesn't cause any sort of illness, it just kind of hangs out. It can't even replicate on its own. For it to spread, you need to be infected with a second actual adenovirus, hence why it's called an adeno-associated virus. It just sort of hitches a ride. Also, it has the useful property that the DNA that gets packaged inside of it often merges with your DNA, but it does so only in a couple of very well-known locations that have been shown to be very, very safe. So how do you make the virus, and how do you choose what DNA ends up on the inside? Well, it all works on a very clever system. To make a virus particle, you need all of the sequences of DNA that code for all the proteins that make the shell of the virus to be transcribed in the same cell. The various pieces will float around until they bump into the rest of the pieces, and then they sort of snap together to form the virus particle. In order for the virus to know which DNA is its own and what to package into the shell, it uses two DNA sequences called ITRs, or inverted terminal repeats. If you put these on either side of some other DNA sequence, everything between the ITRs gets packaged. Normally, this would mean that the virus packages DNA that contains all of the information to make all of its own pieces. But what biologists did is break their DNA into three separate pieces. The first two contain all of the sequences to make all of the proteins, but lack the ITR sequences. The last contains the ITRs and whatever DNA we want to package. By the way, these three pieces of DNA are just called plasmids. They're basically just small circles of DNA that biologists have engineered to have some useful features. I like to think of them like CDs for a computer. They hold a bit of code that contain the instructions for a piece of software. When you run it, the program executes and something happens. In this case, when the plasmid makes it to the nucleus of a cell, it starts being translated into RNA, and then that gets translated into protein. Let's take a closer look at the plasmids to see what's actually going on. On the first two plasmids, you can see the proteins that make up the shell of the virus, and the rest of the proteins that help it move and copy its DNA and package everything. You'll notice that both have something called an ORI, and a gene that codes for ampicillin resistance. That's how you can put this DNA into bacteria and use them as tiny copying machines to make a literal bucket worth of DNA to be used in future experiments. We'll be exploring that process in a future video. The last plasmid is where all of the important parts are. Here you can see the ITRs I mentioned before. This part is called a promoter. It's a sequence that encourages certain proteins to bind to that spot and start transcribing the DNA into RNA to get the process started. Then right after it, we have the LAC-Z gene that we want, and finally, something called a poly-A signal. This is just a part that's necessary for when the protein is actually being made. For both the promoter and poly-A signal, there are a ton of options to choose from, but this particular plasmid uses the CMV promoter and an SV40 poly-A signal. The CMV promoter is really good for when you want lots of protein to be produced wherever the DNA happens to be running. To actually make the virus particles, you take all three pieces of DNA, and using a special agent to help it enter cells, you apply it to a flask of mammalian cells. The cells will start producing the virus particles and filling them with the DNA, and then they exit the cell. All we need to do is harvest the virus, purify it into a safe-to-consume form, and package it into a pill. Okay, now that we know how this works, let's get to work. I'm here in my friend's genetics lab, and he's letting me use his equipment and materials so I can do this project. For this, we'll need a few things. First is the three pieces of DNA. The two virus plasmids come as a kit, and I bought the LAC-Z plasmid separately. We'll be using two kinds of cells, HEC, or human embryonic kidney, and CHO, or Chinese hamster ovary. HEC are the standard for making things like viruses and proteins, but CHO are equally good. HEC cells, or at least the kind that we use, are suspension cells and like to float around, whereas CHO cells are adherent and actually stick to the culture flask. To feed the cells and keep them happy, we'll need special media. I won't show you how to prepare the media, as I'll save that for a future video. And finally, to get the DNA into the cells, we'll be using a special chemical called lipofectamine. First things first, we need to start some cells. All of our work will be taking place in a Biosafety 2 laminar flow hood. This keeps everything super sterile and prevents our cells from getting contaminated or other viruses getting in. Also, we use antibiotics in the media to further limit contamination. Specifically, we use a mixture of penicillin and streptomycin. Before entering the hood, spray down the surface with alcohol, put on gloves, and then spray your arms up to the elbow with the alcohol. Before bringing any materials into the hood, they must be sterile and the container needs to be sprayed with alcohol. Before we can use the media, we need to warm it up to body temperature to keep the cells happy. 
We're using a water bath for this and check the temperature until the media is at least 32 degrees, but no warmer than 37 degrees Celsius. When it's a temp, we can dry it off, sterilize the bottle, and bring it into the hood. To move the media around, we're using special serological pipettes that have a wide opening and come pre-sterilized and individually wrapped. We're also using an auto pipetter that makes it easy to draw and release liquids. We'll be growing our cells in a special tissue culture flask that comes pre-sterilized. In this case, we'll be using a small 25 centimeter flask that holds a maximum of 5 milliliters of liquid. The first step is always to label your flask with the cell type, the experiment, and the date. First, let's look at what we do for the Cho cells. We can remove the lid of the flask and the lid of the media, placing the lids face down on the work surface. Then set up the auto pipetter with a fresh pipette and draw up 4 mils of media. For Cho cells, that means F12K media supplemented with 10% fetal bovine serum. Pick up the flask, tilt it, and dispense the liquid. It's good practice to limit things touching as much as physically possible. Then dispose of the pipette and then tilt the dish back and forth until the media covers the bottom. With the flask prepared, we can add our cells. I'm using a regular P1000 micropipette and I'm adding the cells that we grew and prepared in advance. I'll show how we did that in a future video. For the hex cells, we did basically the same thing, but because they're suspension cells, we just grew them to the density we wanted in a larger flask, and then pulled off 5 milliliters worth of suspension and transferred that to a new flask to be used immediately. The Cho cells need more time to grow though, so those get transferred to a CO2 humidified incubator set at 37 degrees Celsius and 5% CO2. Since the hex cells are already ready, we can go through the transfection procedure. For this, we'll need the lipofectamine, which comes in two parts, the media for the hex cells, and the three DNA solutions. To set this up, we first put 500 microliters of hex media into two sterile DNA-free epitubes. We want 5 micrograms of DNA total, which works out to 1.6 micrograms of each type of DNA, or 6.8 microliters of each DNA solution. Add that to one of the tubes and to the same tube add 5 microliters of lipofectamine plus reagent. To the other tube, we add 5 microliters of regular lipofectamine. Give those a mix, then mix the DNA solution into the lipofectamine, not the other way around. Allow that to incubate for 5 minutes. Lipofectamine is sort of an oil that forms a bubble called liposomes around the DNA that allows it to get across the cell membrane. It takes a few minutes for the liposomes to form, hence the incubation time. After the incubation, all that we have to do is add the solution to the flask of cells. With that done, the flask can be transferred to the incubator. The reason we're using two cell types is because I actually tried this experiment twice. The first time was with the hex cells, but the cells died because the lipofectamine is kind of aggressive and can damage the cells. The second time, the procedure was the same, but I used the Cho cells, which, because they're adhered to the dish, have the added benefit that 12 hours after the transfection, I can change the media to fresh lipofectamine-free media. This keeps the cells much healthier. The Cho cells worked, so we let them sit and produce as much virus as possible for three whole days. To check to see if this worked, we'll be using a color-changing dye called Xgal. Xgal is a dye molecule fused to a galactose molecule, so that if lactase is present, the two get split, the dye becomes active and turns blue, and we know that the thing is working. I made a solution of 2 mg of Xgal in 5 mL of DMSO. This has the benefit that DMSO will carry the Xgal into cells that we expose to it. Also, DMSO is one of the only things that can actually dissolve Xgal. Because the Cho cells were adhered, before we do the test, we can collect all the media, which is where most of the virus is going to be. Save this in a separate sterile falcon tube. Then we can test the cells themselves. First, we need to make them let go of the dish so that we can take a sample and test them. To do that, we'll be using 2 milliliters of pre-made trypsin solution. Allow the trypsin to sit in the dish until the solution starts to get a bit cloudy. This is evidence that the cells have let go and are floating around. When this happens, I use a pipette to collect all of the cells and transfer them to a falcon tube. These then get loaded into a centrifuge and spun down at 5,000 RPM for 5 minutes to pellet them onto the bottom so that we can remove the trypsin. When that's done, we need to re-sterilize everything and bring it back into the hood so that we can take our sample. I removed the trypsin solution and resuspended the cells in 2 milliliters of media, and then took a 200 microliter sample and transferred it to a small tube. I added an equal volume of Xgal and then let everything sit for a while to give it time for the reaction to occur if any lactase is present. After the incubation, I took everything to the microscope so that we can see what actually happened. It was really hard to capture with my camera, but the cells were definitely blue. And with that, I knew that everything had worked and that we can finally harvest the virus. For this very first round of testing, we'll actually be using a really straightforward method to harvest our virus. First things first, the media full of virus that we saved has to be spun down at 2000 RPM to pellet any cellular debris. The virus is super light, so it'll just stay floating around. Collect the supernatant and leave any solids behind. 
To get the virus out of the solution, we can add ammonium sulfate solution. This is what's known as salting out. Ideally, you do this in two steps to first remove the residual protein and then pellet the virus, but I'm just going to be doing this all in one step. I'm adding an equal volume of 4 molar ammonium sulfate solution. This sudden influx of salt makes the virus precipitate out so that we can actually collect it. Let that sit for an hour and then spin it down at 4000 RPM to collect the product. Now, I know this will be contaminated with other proteins, but for this test, I judge that to be an acceptable risk based on all of the possible protein contamination. In the future, this will be refined much further and more purification steps will be in place to make sure the virus is truly the only thing in here. Remove the supernatant and discard it, then redissolve the viral pellet in 800 microliters of sterile phosphate buffered saline. And that's most of it done. All that's left is to package this into a pill. To do that, I mix the solution with a minimal amount of microcrystalline cellulose, and then put that into gel caps using this handy gel cap jig machine thing. Ideally, I should have freeze dried the powder before packaging, but again, for the initial test, I decided I didn't want to wait. Well, bottoms up. After taking the pills, I waited three days to give the virus time to deliver the DNA and give my cells time to start producing lactase. And then, it was time to test it. We ordered the milkiest, cheesiest pizza we could. Ranch dressing, barbecue sauce, chicken poppers, mozzarella cheese. If this doesn't hurt him, nothing will. <laughs> Try to be less scared. Fear is the mind killer. You're the bravest scientist. Yeah. Mm. Is it good? It is. It is real good. Unadulterated cheese. Is this the one with ranch dressing? Yeah. This is yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Is this the one with... Can you not tell? Yeah. No, I can tell. Yeah. Or a little ranch. Now, I'll be honest. This was maybe one of the most stressful moments in recent memory. Willingly eating something that would normally make me extremely sick scared the hell out of me. But I ate several pieces and then settled into a movie. After an hour, I felt fine. After a whole night's sleep, I still felt fine. And after 48 hours, I was completely fine. I couldn't believe it, but the therapy seemed to have actually worked. Okay, so it's now been two weeks since I've taken the therapy. As you can see, got more pizza. I've been enjoying just the most copious amounts of lactose-filled foods over the last two weeks. It's been wonderful. I feel better than I have in eight years. So, I'm going to enjoy some pizza now. Still good. At first when I was testing this, I would still get a little bit of gas, but that's completely gone away now. I think it just took a while for more protein to be expressed and for my microbiome to readjust to the radical change in diet. As I said, this project is still in the development stage, and more testing will need to be done. I'll be taking notes to see if the effect wears off after some time, and I'll be sure to keep you updated. If this project interested you and you want to see more, I'd really appreciate if you'd leave a rating and subscribe to see when I post new videos. I post a new video every Monday, so be sure to click the bell icon to get updates. As always, a big thank you to my patrons who help make these videos possible. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.